Hello there everyone and welcome back to TNO The Last Days of Europe. As you probably know by now if you're here for the fourth episode of this campaign by Like a River. Report on the status of the CPC insurgency in Eastern Yunnan and Jinan more generally from to the Communist Party of China. Far from being defeated, it just begins insurgency in full force with Viet Minh and other back in their presence has been noted in virtually all regions of Jinan and Yunnan in particular. The precise nature of the development or deployment is believed to be sending infiltration agents down into Yunnan through the twin routes of Guangxi and Vietnam, per the directions of the CPC General Officer Commanding Yi Zheng Yi. And most interesting of all is that the Communist Party of China reached an agreement with the local portion of the National Revolutionary Army in eastern Yunnan, the terms of which are as follows: a. Refusal to fight one another or, to, or treat each other's formations as hostile. <clears throat> Be a refusal to intervene in one another's affairs without a grave need and the consent of the parties affected for. This agreement was deemed necessary since, as Agent Chen with the CCP guerrillas stated, the last thing we need in the middle of a war of a national liberation is yet another civil war. Given by this day of 19, duly noted, Long Yun's contemplation. A similarity, or similarity, between Long Yun's a uh, Kutsiotic venture that he even recognized was unlikely to succeed, and that of Kai E 40 years and more was not lost on him. Just like the man they call Song Po. He was in charge of the National Protection Army based out of Yunnan. Just like General Kai, he was fighting an at least apparently uphill battle against a disgusting perversion of what he believed in for the late general. It had been Yuan Shi Kai's egomaniacal attempt to declare himself emperor after all the effort China of his waste had wasted through when the Aizen Gyoro scum down. For long, it was, of course, a pretentious set of false leaders grinding China to dust in the name of modernizing it, backed by foreign imperialist power that occupied in the name of freeing it from oppression. Just like in the National Protection War, the battle Long was fighting seemed unlikely to end in victory, but for Kai, things changed very quickly. Many of Yuan's generals opposed his insane quest to crown himself, and defections took place en masse. Would there be defection in the NPA's favor, on the other hand? He'd have to watch and see. Standing up from the other chair on which he'd been sitting, he looked up to the heaven and made a great and terrible vow to the soul of his predecessor. Indeed, General Kai, I will make you proud. I'll free China to try and be certain of that. The call to arms. The following is an entry from the diary of Zhang Zimin on the day of Long Yun's return, year 1966, January. Time has come. General Long Yun has finally announced his official return, and Xinan shall be free now. In the immediate aftermath of his announcement, I summoned all the dissidents, all the true sons of China, those loyal to it and its people, to arms. With them behind me, we moved in three directions, overthrowing the urban administrations and ex extricating prisoners who were on our side, assisting the communists in seizing control of the rural areas, and locking up the stubborn Japanophiles and Luhan loyalists that refused to swear loyalty to free China. Meanwhile, in accordance with Madame's wishes, I will leave matters in the hands of Wang Jia, Jia Yu. Then, after bringing Yi Jingying and his staff to meet with the general, I will rush to Sichuan and personally join the resistance led by the Minmeng. This has to be done success in Sichuan is critical to the MPA's success in a dream of a free China. Yes, chances do not look good. The launching traders have more than enough to settle Sichuan and us once and for all. We're outmatched by them, both in manpower and resources. For the larger, largest backer of the Sichuan resistance, the Yu Wen Hui of Ji Kang is being held back by his cowardly subordinates, who are refusing to join him and assist in assisting the NPA and threatening a mutiny if they do so. But it doesn't matter. We dissidents, we believers in a free China, will fight. We'll give our best to this gamble to preserve our hope and our future, and as a reproach to these pitiful traitors who abandoned China's future long ago. Death to the traitors, a curse upon the learning dogs. Death to the Japs and Pyrrhus and their demonic abomination of a despot. Eternal life and glory and honor to free China. Long live, long live, long live, long live. The summons ring out. While the Revol National Revolutionary Army remnants received the notification that their provisional leader, General Long Yun, that Lu Han had foolishly run off to Bo Xiaon, and Long was about to make his move, they knew that the time had at last come. As the message percolated in advance of Luhan's vacation, the NRA partisans celebrated the beginning of the long-awaited struggle against the true enemies in the RC, RGOC in Japan. Meanwhile, the leadership, not least amongst these, Song Zilian, Li Mi, and Zheng Chong, moved to leave the matters of mobilization to their subordinates and rushed to Kunming with a small retinue to prepare for the inevitable. When Long Yun flanked, flanked as he always was by Zheng Zisheng and An Empu, he saw the three generals coming towards them from the southwest. They ran out from the gate out without his sandals and embraced them, calling them to eat and drink a little with him before they got set to work. The reunion party between the old federal fighters against foreign imperialism was cheerful but relatively short after all. There was much work to be done. Now, with the NPA, NRA, and Jinan were united in one purpose, they're free to continue the war of resistance that had never ended and fight into the, unto death to cleanse Japanese crimes in the motherland. And the brave and true respond. Uh, so, also right now. Uh, oh, ooh. They have a lot more support than we do. I thought we... I'm pretty sure I sent them guns, so... Yeah, give them 10%. How do they get more influence? If we don't get Sejuan, I mean, I've heard that's not super important to get Sejuan. It'd be good to get, but still. Yeah, it could decrease your influence a little bit. We do have enough command power, so. There you go. Clash in Sejuan. Oh, right. Approximately 10 to 15% of our support level will be converted into our influence level. Honor, huh? Of course, we're doing honors. 
Uh, I can't remember what I read this cell. If you read this, please go right ahead. But, every man a soldier. Four year draft wouldn't be bad. Banned from service, total service equality. Z new zealous officer staff. It's not bad. You lose a lot of daily command power gain, though. Ah, uh, but the free production units. Oh, that's nice. Let's do New Zealand's officer staff. Every boy has dreamed of a military service in China for the past few millennia fastidiously. Stood alive and works at Sun Tzu. He's not the end of strategy, but in all ways, he's the beginning. One of his sagest lessons is the importance of a capable and loyal officer who can clearly communicate both up the line to his superiors and down the line to his inferiors. It also helps if the officer is not an ab abject coward and an enemy of the people. China was rather few on such officers, and once they were removed, we must not find replacements. From three directions, the new leaders of China flock. Remnants of all that once was, nationalists and communists alike, flock to aid us in our endeavors. Radicals loyal to the cause of free China, who have no home in the hellscape of safe China, run to us with their enthusiasm. From within the surviving rank and file of the old regime are many men with great talent but little enthusiasm. Together, these men will help each other become the officers that China will need if she is to be free. All of it will be vital if we are to build an army great enough to destroy the great enemy. Wait, what happened to our... Influence. Secret state. The NRA's first steps for deliberating China has been taken as large swaths of rural Yunnan have been seized under the command of Zhang Zhang. Many small towns and villages have had their uh, local governments purged of Japanese collaborators and replaced by NRA bureaucrats and have been garrisoned by NRA soldiers. This marks the beginning of the NRA's long held goal of exercising all Japanese influence from China. For now, the liberation is to succeed. Uh, then many of the different factions of the distance must at the very least tolerate the existence of one another. Lest China fall into infighting once again and become a Japanese lapdog. The NRA has already been working with, together with the NPF for quite some time, with Zhang Chong working to deepen the ties between the two forces in hopes of achieving sh shared goals. While well, many members of the NRA are less than thrilled by as the emergence of the CPC, with many NRA soldiers and officers being staunch anti commies, an air of distrust has set in between the two factions. Yet, Sung Zilian, head of the NRA, has preached for a policy of toleration between the two. For now, the goals are aligned when it comes to expulsion of Japanese influence from China. Luckily, the last two decades have taught the NRA to tolerate practices and ideas that they are uncomfortable with. First, it was smuggling opium to finance their guerrilla activities, and now it's fighting alongside commie soldiers. In the end, they all know that one thing matters above all else, saving China. For anything, China, anything goes. Oh, we can invest political power, too. Oh, we don't have political power, so. We meet again. Long Yun tried to sted steadily steady his uh, shaking hand while composing the letter, hoping that it would finally end the lack of contact with the communists that had lasted since the end of the war. Though his nerves made, him incre made that incredibly difficult. Considering gaining their support would make or break the NPI's chances of defeating the traitors and indeed the Japanese themselves. However, uh, just then there were two loud raps on the doors of his office. Command accidentally shouted before restraining himself. Zheng Zemin watched, walked in through the swinging door, followed by Yi Zheng Ying, Yang Dezi, and Yang Cheng Wu. Uh, and of course, in a single file. Sharply and quickly, they arrived at the long desk as quickly as they had processed that they had, they had arrived. The governor was unable to hide his shock and amazement at their unexpected arrival, and it took him a few moments to speak. I, uh, <clears throat> I didn't know any of you were coming. This is most unexpected. Yi shrugged. Well, even though your forces in the MPA at large haven't been in direct contact with their cells for nearly 20 years, this young man here is always the guy who's connected. We came as soon as we heard the news last week. The others nodded an affirmation. Zhang placed a briefcase on Long's desk as Yi uh, Zheng Ying, Zheng Ying spoke up. It's good to see you again, Governor. Three decades have felt like lifetimes given the circumstances. Long merely nodded, attempting to remain professional while later beyond compare and side. Fifteen minutes later, Zhang had pulled out a marked map from 1946 and spread across the desk. The group, joined by several NPA members, huddled around the desk as Yang Dezi and Yang Cheng Wu described the situation and went over a detailed plan about the collaborationist attack Yuning on. One way or another, they all knew they would have to fight like heck to free China and to free the people. Without Chiang and Mao's bickering, the armies of the movements united as one, Nanjing would fall. And with the Japanese imposed slavery over China. Well, let's hope. Any, oh, nothing here. Okay. Industry management, nice. Honor's good. Of course, it's a 66. I do want to make sure that we have, we're have we good on gun stuff. We're still working on a lot of the gun stuff. Motorized would not be bad. Uh, it's not bad. Soft attack's not terrible to get to. Uh, do we have enough soft attack? Ooh, we'll get some more soft attack from the artillery. The war machine? Uh, uniforms, boots, bullets, guns, gear. One after one, the factories are coming back to life, churning with renewed vigor. Every day, the reports come in. Production grows and grows and grows. Ever faster, ever more irresponsible in the short term, but ever more ob obviously necessary. The needs of our army are infinite, yet our, inabil our ability to spy it is almost vast. Women who once held their husbands at the village forge, repairing ancient tools with ancient methods, now run their own workshops, churning out mortars, rifles, machine guns. We know at least one village who has pooled the resources with the intent to build a tank. So it is, it is victory that us, people of Yunnan and Guizhou, united in our struggles and sacrifices, shall pursue victory through labor, victory through diligence, victory upon the steady backs and flaming hearts of us all. Now, we'll read up front line just a moment here, but let's get through some uh, comments, shall we? Someone says, a comment to support the National Protection Army. 
Someone says, if you didn't want the opposition to keep rising, you probably should have increased the Yersons, which is true. Someone says, Long Yun is still alive and he will get revenge. He And he will get revenge. So, and okay, someone says, do all the focuses and keep control of the government. Find the loyalty. Well, it is what it is. Fine. Front line. F6, Yiliang, we've been over this 10,000 times already, hissed Kian. Right fingers clutching onto a sinking forehead. Nobody, I mean, nobody in the right mind in this office would go just to bomb Fs nowhere and throw themselves in front of bullets. You wouldn't dare if you even care about one bit about your own life. I care about what's happening right now on the ground. Liu felt his own voice booming across the desk, crashing upon his editor-in-chief, the creators. We're blowing up roads and pipes, the people left without a home to return to. This is war we're talking about, sir. War right at our doorsteps, and I just don't want to see why everyone here is acting like it's nothing. Because it is nothing, and you are throwing your life away for nothing. A slam of the desk, Kian darted to his feet. Literally another month and I'll be over, Liu Yiliang. And I will not let the whole new Sichuan daily get in trouble just because if some moron wants to kill himself in the meantime. He grabbed and shook Liu by the collar. You ding-dongs know full well that Long Yun's dying to blow your brains out all over the cabin walls before you even take a step off the plane. How the heck are we supposed to explain it to Nanjing people if we find you lying in a ditch? Tell him I chose this fate of my own. The voice poured out of Liu's mouth, unwavering. Perhaps so. You'd want to uh, keep the explanation for the men in the NPA tomorrow. Chong Ching could switch hands for, for all I know. I don't know about you, sir, but I refuse to turn a blind out of the shifting tides of history. The grip uh, loosened. For a few moments, silence filled the room before Kian, with a side, resigned sigh, capitulated. Where else is always open? He took out his pen. Go grab the films. That old camera of yours. Anything you can take. You brought this upon yourself. Don't say I didn't warn you. With one more curt nod, the t fighter turned around and stepped into battle. Wow, we got like no influence. Soldiers from bandits. The victory over the tax collectors had felt better than any drug. Wei and his bandits found themselves traveling from village to village, town to town, to attack government forces, to drive away any soldiers and bureaucrats and all manner of parasites. Each time they arrived, the reaction for the people was one of awe and gratitude. People invited them into their homes and thanked them and offered them food and shelter. Where they once had been nuisances, they were now heroes. Perhaps the other men felt this too, the joy of this newfound purpose. Perhaps it was why the men allowed Wei to become their informal leader and had allowed him to move into northern Burma. Perhaps it was why they did not question it when Wei marched them into Zhang Chong's encampment and took a meeting with the old rebel, rebel leader who seemed more bemused by Wei's exploits than impressed. You have my spirit, I'll say that, but you're inefficient and disorganized. Stay with me for a few weeks and I'll make you into something stronger and I'll turn you into liberator, said Zhang. And he did. The work was grueling, more than once. Wei woke up expecting to find that his men had left in the middle of the night. Instead, day by day, week by week, his men remained. They learned how to use military equipment and theories of tactics and strategy. They received uniforms to replace their old ragged clothes. Their bodies became fitter, healthier. At the end of the ordeal, Wei realized that he was no longer a bandit but a soldier. It was something that he had tried to be, something that he relished. He was no longer someone who would pray on the week for the scraps, but someone who would fight and die for China and his people. As soon as Zhang gave the word, he and his man would descend from the mountains. Then they'd break the chains of imperialism and usher in a new age of freedom. Service for the people. I'll get some divisions here too. A message from the southwest is next. So you are commanding. There's 12 divisions of 12 combat width. And then we got 4 divisions of 12 combat width. So all the four, 12 combat widths are right there. You have 6 combat, six divisions of decent-ish infantry. And that's why you're all together. And we have 7 divisions of 18 combat width. So. And there's both 12, so I'm going to throw you both here then. That's fine. Cool. And that's not looking too bad either. Hopefully get some better army professionals. But the messenger bowed before Ma Yi Yuan and Jiang Jing Guo. Generals, he said, his voice firm and excited, I bring you news. The southwestern provinces are at the edge of rebellion, and warfare has commenced among the mountains. The flap of the command tent was ajar, letting a single blade of light bleed into the room, casting shadows over the rugged and carpeted interior. Between Ma and Jiang was a small, low table. The cups of Tiana cast faint wisps of steam into the air. Ma Yi Yuan grinned. War was a Ma's family's natural occupation. Twenty years of conventional guerrilla warfare has honed that love into a professional art. That's good news, he said, barely containing the excitement he felt at the news. The Ma's are in full support of the insurrection. Jane's response, however, was more muted. Though he received the news with the same joy, his heartfelt trepidation of the thought of joining the war outright at this stage. He looked at Ma Ji, uh, Ji Yuan. That's good, indeed good news, he said to the messenger, and you have done the admirable work of crossing the deserts under full view of the Japanese. I am thankful, however. Clasping his hands, he sighed, I have matters of state. To discuss with the general Ma. Leave us if you please. The messenger bowed and turned to leave. I know what you're going to say, young Jiang, the Ma general said regarding Jing Guo with utter seriousness, but the Ma's are powerful. We'd rally the family. We can break through that dude Tzu Ji's lines and rendezvous with the insurrection. Give us the order and we will move heaven and earth to fulfill it. Jiang smirked, resisting the, the impulse of chuckle. I'll command no one in this army, general. You know this better than most, he said, putting his fingers on the low table as if to enunciate his words. However, I would like to exercise caution. We have fought the Japanese for 20 years. And throw away our struggle for an uncertain chance of victory would demean the memory of the Generalissimo and those who died before him. Ma Juan fell silent. Perhaps he stood up 
to leave through the flaps of the tent. I mean no insult to the memory of your father, but I think that it is best that we take action now. The Ma did not ride out their camps. Their soldiers did not march. Oh, boy. We're going to need a few people to march here and there, just so that we don't all die here, probably. And I'm probably going to struggle with this off-screen, but... Li Shun, the old heavyset man, walked the pass. I came down from the mountains. As he continued on his way, spring made... Spring's passing made its appearance, more evident by each in passing moment. The muddy roads with the dirt mixed with the melting snow, the budding short grass, and the shy pink blush of the cherry trees, blossoming or booming in the early spring breeze. The little man wore a robe weaved from flax and below it. He wore a cotton shirt and trousers, and his hands was a walking stick, and on his foot was a worn sandal made out of rope. On his shoulders he carried a burlap sack, provisions for the road ahead. The weather was warm, and although the wind still had, to be, uh, had the winter sting, he found the weather refreshing. Halfway to this destination, while the sun was still high, he sat beside uh, spring trees. The grass was dry now, the dew evaporating in the heat. The old man and son slung the burlap sack from his shoulders and ate the bread that his men had cooked for him. He watched a cherry blossom flutter in the air, one brush his, tree, his cheek. Occasionally, a uniformed man on a horseback would pass by him in silence. After finishing his food, he stood up. I don't think we need to do that, but whatever. Oh, when he arrived in Kunming, the sun was setting. He stopped by a cart bearing all kinds of baked goods and bought for himself a bean jam filled bread. He strolled through the streets. Taken in the city sites before setting himself down on a wooden bench at surface course due to rain and snow long ago, the Buddhist sages would pass through Kunming whether they were Chinese, Indian, or Tibetan. The, spiral, the spires and pagodas of Kunming ornate in the mixture of red and gold gilded in, or in the red, rose gold colors of the sky and cast the sunset, cast long shadows of the gown like hands of a clock. And when he came back, he thought all this would burn. The stores, carts, pagodas, temples, and even the cherry blossom trees would be a set of fire before it all. There he would be, his figure casting a long shadow behind him. He whispered a, a voice lost in, in the night. If it all must be sacrificed for the freedom of a thousand generations hence, I would not hesitate. Nice. Oh. Actually, this is still going up quite a bit. Function administration with a stream on it. Bureaucracy is it's very strong. Still get some good political power. Nice. War machine, of course. Every man a soldier. Dai Bai was a minor. He saw his son once a week for ten years. Han Guan Yu was a truck driver. He used to be a school teacher, but with all the children and work, he had to find new employment. Li Zhen was a janitor in the Bureau of Public Appropriations. He used to run the Kunming Antiquarium Society from the office before the government of Luhan took it over. Now Bai Dong is a private first class who trains diligently in broad daylight every day. Han Guan Yu is still a truck driver, but he now he has his own unit of trucks beneath him, and once more he is a teacher. Li Zhen is a staff sergeant who uses his organizational ability to help set up new training camps all over southwest China. And in uniform, a man may be the most he can be. To fulfill your duties and fulfill your potential, your part in unshackling China forever from the demons that honor him. For today, every man shall be a soldier, charging with rifle in hand and tenacity in heart for the most sacred of causes and against the greatest of adversities. Widening the cracks. The ringing of the telephone had been getting deafening over the past couple of days, nonetheless. Song Qingling ignored the constant calls while reading the morning paper, fresh out of the press and still warm to the, t to the touch. Yunnan and Gui Su in open revolt, the front headline said in big bold letters. She'd been alerted by the fact that by that letter last night. Surprising as the news of the events outside her gilded cage typically took a week to reach her. Song turned her head and glanced outside the broad widow which sat behind her armchair. Faintly heard through the narrow crack was a sweet sound of resistance. But a small interface to see the valor and protesters and dissidents who had dared to demonstrate in the broad daylight. The crowd, there must have been thousands of people, carried placards and shouted slogans demanding the government to cease collaboration and to reconcile with the rebels in the southwest. Song was proud this was her doing after all. Though she could not identify the faces in the crowd, she knew many among them belonged to the dissident network she had cultivated from her office through not but a pen and an aptitude for organization. Alas, a fleeting saccharine tune could only last so long that Nanjing police dispersed the crowd within an hour and a half. But the response had been dampened. Resources had been clearly diverted to the war in the southwest. Perhaps more significantly, the matter not to the protest was broken up. They'd be back, larger in number and louder than before. The spirit of defiance was waste for no one, obeys neither the baton nor the water cannon, and she would do her part in assisting and organizing them. Song, for the first time in weeks, picked up their phone, and she had good many calls to make. The gears began to turn and stand up and fight. Yunnan, Guizhou, merely two of China's provinces among many, indeed the last oasis of honor and righteousness, surrounded by the boundless murky sea of oppression and treachery to our east and north, daunting perhaps, but even to the strongest will, but who is the Chinese man, the avatar of diligence and audacity, to submit to such paltry fears? For liberation is our purpose, our inexcusable duty. Against the darkness, we, shall, we sound forth the bugles uh, across the Yangtze and the plains, from Guangxi to Heliojiang. Against a storm we raise high the banners, with every last drop of vigor and righteous fury amassed from every man and woman of Jinan. For the strong enable their rifles, for the deb debilitated, wrenches and cargo trucks. All shall find the place under our noble cause, for we shall exclude no one we cannot afford to. Dreams of Europe. It was Austria, March 1938. The cold winds whispered through the trees, trees, trees and trees, and stripped of their leaves, laid them themselves on the sides of the road. He could think of no reason why he was here again, cask or encased in a tank. 
His hands felt for the cuffs and insignia of his rank. Wehrmacht Fenrek. That would be Sergeant Candidate. He remembered Kriegsschule out of the officer school and straight into Austria. Blinking, he looked at the men around him. Where are we? He said, tapping the shoulders of the radio operative. <clears throat> In Austria, I mean, he added, noticing the weird looks of the crew were giving him. Not far from the border, the driver said. Austrian soldiers opened the way for a few clicks back. No resistance? Nil. All right. He rose from his seat. I'm opening the hatch. I'm going to take a look. With a rasp, the hatch swung open. The breeze stirred the loose hairs hanging from under his cap, and it blew whispers in his ears. He shivered. Even after spending four years studying in Germany, he could not get used to European colds. The skies were overcast, but no snow had been forthcoming since morning. He sighed, and, pu and a puff of warmth bristled the air before fading away. The scene shifted. Humidity laid in the air. The quiet Austrian countryside transformed before him. Bodies patted the ground, lying in pools of their own blood. His crews attempted to get him back into the tank, but their voices became lost as a breeze screeched with the screams of men and the bustling of shells. A hurricane formed ahead, shifted in the sands of this place. A few grains struck his eyes, far ahead, and a tank gun boom, its discharge slammed into his tank, and the world rang, rang, rang. Zheng Wei Go opened his eyes and sat up. The prison bells were ringing. For some soldiers, wars do not end in peace. But the Chinese army unbowed. Long Yun is not born for war. Was not born. No one was. He was not raised to fight and die beneath the banner of nation, his nation. Such, however, was the call of the times, and to his call he answered, standing in the hallowed halls of the United Military Academy. It's not talent that makes war, but discipline. China's lacked discipline for decades. In its place was a rotten shell barely hiding the blackened heart that Japan has secreted beneath, beneath or within her breast. We're not soft, we do not bend, we do not bow. We're China. May the Huns howl, may the barbarian babble, may the kamikaze blow itself upon the mountains of our home. The mountain does not bow, the long union does not bow. China shall never bow again. We have drilled and practiced, practiced and drilled. Once again, the courtyards of the southwest are full of marching men in columns and lines. See the banners, hear the drums, see the war crowds surround you, fill you, raise you up as you witness the army trying to stretch on as far as the eye can see. Lose the population, but you get more division organization, which is going to be important. Navy organization probably doesn't really matter, honestly. Lose some recovery, but we get more attack and defense and planning speed and max planning, which is really good. And military professionals will begin to rapidly improve, which is what I'm really aiming here for. Oh, look at that. So you two are 12 combos, so come over here. And you guys are 15. Do we? I didn't make those. Yeah, I didn't make those divisions. Okay. You guys are 15. It's fine. This point, I might actually do this instead. We might actually be able to guard the full border. And my hope is that they just start attacking like crazy, because obviously we're not going to be super, super, super well supplied, so. Hungry south of Germany. Do we have any more equipment? Oh, we need way more motorized. Oh, crap. That's not good. Yeah. Well, we definitely need those production units. Well, which one do you got? Dang it. Um, so if I remember correctly, we will need... We will go to war very soon. Like, very, 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 very soon. It's not bad. More production units down the traders. Ooh, this would be good to get immediately, because you get more attack and defense against the enemy. Ooh, well, better, way better surrender limit. Rapid fortifications. Uh, combat's going to be good. The fly on the cracked egg. A mountain people would be very good. Yeah, we'll probably go this way next. Never again. But then again, down with the traders is very good. Yeah, that's so good to get. So, the fly on the cracked egg. You should take a good look at this one. Uh, Z Z Li Jian. By Cheng Hen. Burst into the office, still out of breath, with a scrawny man in a tattered suit of his grass. Effort tried to stake his way through the outpost three hours in a curfew. And even had the guts to run. And guess what? He flinged around his free right hand. And inside his grip was a fat stack of paper notes. Who knew that a tiny brief case could fit 500 effing thousand Japanese money in? Zhang uh, Li Jiang felt his eyebrows raised. Intriguing now, then, intruder. He leaned forward, gaze locking with the tattered man. We do often know who sent you here, what you plan to do, or we will find it necessary to put you in indefinite detention. Nanjing sent me. Well, as a blunt, almost spat out answer, the money will go into our potential friends in your city's barracks armory just to let the good people up there know that you no gooders have been up to. The man smirked, figured I'd tell you since, well, I've come all the way here and have nothing to lose anyway. Any accomplices? I don't feel particularly compelled to inform a bunch of dead men walking. The smirk faded from the man's mouth and instead a curious solemnness, but who knows? But know this. Before we part ways, nothing good will come out from swimming against the tide of history. That's all we need to know. Chang Hang, take this man away to the factories and report the confiscations to the treasury. The voice out of Zhang's mouth was routine mo mo monotone, yet, once again, currents were stirring within his mind. How many people have been compromised by Nanjing? Or might be. How long till it's safe enough to, for the battle drums to roll? Regards, the twin iron porch says named Yunnan and Guisu stand impenetrable still in this. Zhang can always find a morsel of solace in. It's only for a little while longer. Increase support by 15. Offer partisans a few hundred funds. A few funds to help them operate effectively. Send weapons to partisans. 
Huh. Clash in Sichuan. Influence will depend. Yeah, fall between five and six quickly. Oh. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, this point is probably too low, too late for that. So it's fine, whatever. Loyalty. Complicit. I I want to get that uh, production used as fast as possible. Well, that looks pretty good. That'll help us out quite a bench. Bench bunch. Yeah. Complacent peasants. The millions of peasants on whom this little patch of soil rests are suffering. From the blood and sweat oozing from the skins, from Luhan's wicked schemes in the names of progress, and above all, from a hopeless drain of willpower from the distant matters, such as growing a spine and standing up against subjugation treachery. Our people suffer for utter exhaustion has left them blind to their own virtues, but indeed, virtues they are. Still embedded within their beating hearts, courage, tenacity, fellowship in the face of catastrophe. Have it not been our peasants, after all, who rallied behind us as we took up arms against those raining havoc upon our motherland? Have it not been our peasants who once bestowed us tremendous strength and unity as people of Yunnan, the strength? Truly beyond compare all throughout the knowledge of China's history. Blind to their own virtues of peasants may be. We shall open their eyes once more by awakening them from their slumber or prying open their eyelids if we have to. Let us say a stream of education programs, propaganda, and punitive measures re enlighten our brethren to our purest of intentions and the truest of truths. That in the face of all devouring darkness, our fight is their fight and our nation is their nation. I'm here just for the production units, but not really. What did you do for in the war? Once again, we saw the maelstrom of Japanese uh, savagery converge upon our borders, and we cried to our peasants, our laborers, to stand up and fight. Once we had unadulterated faith in our own countrymen, and the commitment towards honor, dignity, and a common cause. But we all—all all we found was disappointment. We went with our very eyes, hundreds upon hundreds of our own brothers and sisters turning their backs on us, deserting us, failing or falling at first into the enemy's false-hearted embrace, isolated and facing insurmountable adversity on all fronts. We have no choice but to withdraw deeper into the southwestern ranges, and the shame of injustice and betrayal etched upon our hearts. Today, however, this shame shall be no more. As our old commander Long Yunus sends the Yunnan's home once again, it's time we summon those who abandon us to the mercy of the Japanese horde. We should delegate them to our mills and steelworks, where they shall have their debts repaid and their hearts and minds cleansed and reforged by the fiery flames of labor. And as our crowd the brethren toil towards redemption with a second life that we have been granted, they, may they ask themselves that darning question, what did you do in the war? Since one sides with the Gao Zongwu. Yu Long has failed. Since Yuan, so valuable Trug has sided with their enemies. Our units with, the, with orders to take positions along the border already begin to move in, and said that the local guerrillas and garrisons already flocked to Ga Gao Zong Wu's side. Sichuan, whilst being a linchpin in China, is also an extremely populous and resource wealthy one at that. The news that Sichuan's side of the traitors has damaged our legitimacy to no end, as the populace now begins to see our, uh, our enemies as the rightful overlords of China. While connected, the connection of Sichuan to the rest of the traitor held lands is an issue, we would do well to forget this fact. We cannot allow to defeat a cloud of judgment. Every son of China must prepare for the final battle. No ideas left, not bad. Door to absolution. Alright, so all that stuff is done. I do want to get down there eventually, but uh, max building is a state. Game more factories. Factory output would be good. Do both these. Door to absolution. Oh, uh, Gao Zongwu, president of the Republic of China, negotiator, traitor, coward. Uh, word after word flashed across Long Moon's mind as he sat under the flickering yellow lamp lights. A blank sheet of paper before him and a fountain pen in his trembling hand. What unparalleled power this title, this dog tag, have bestowed upon him. Let a single stroke of his pen erect another monstrous instrument of blood and sweat from the ground and a hundred living, breathing Chinese bodies be sacrificed on the altar and hurled it into its howling furnaces. And then a hundred more, then, yet then a hundred more, all in the name of progress of a brighter future for eons to come. Yeah, no mountain of uh, hollow rhetoric. No cascade of smelting iron shall wash away uh, who the almighty president truly is, a docile brainless mutt drooling at whatever his dog masters dangle in front of him and happily licking their buttocks. His prized modernizations are but a gilded cage, a venture upon shoddy foundations, and the freedom and prosperity that is promised to follow a rotten delusion, a lie. Second after fleeting, Second, the thoughts gnawed at the king of the southwest mine, and the times he almost darted up from his seat and thrashed his pen at the ground, yet a fragment of reason held him back. Perhaps it made him his judgment, even Wang Jingwei. The archtrader himself had had a glint of doubt and shame dancing within his eyes, as long as witness within the very confines of Kunming and the waiting days of 1938. Perhaps there was still a slimmer of honor, of reason, of some basic effing dignity, lingering within the man sitting atop the presidential palace. He closed his eyes as those memories of ages past departed his aging mind. Hunched over his wooden desk and began with a letter. China is a nation of honor, not barbarity. Gao should know, as every ma Chinese man knows all too well. Thus, Mr. President, I implore you to see reason, as we have talked about the stab in the back. 
Lu Han was the cousin of Long Yun as well as his comrade. He was a cousin when he fought beside him for Free China. He was his cousin when they propped up this little patch of soil on the borders of our motherland with a, both their colossal might. He was his cousin when his heart grew weak and black, and after, as day after day he turned his back further on everything they once stood for, a cow towing to the dog masters draped in gold while drinking greedy from the sweat and blood of our own kin, but why? What could have driven him, let alone millions and millions more littered across all of China, into this bottomless chasm of unrepentant slavery, this decadence? And as the king of the southwest pondered and pondered, the truth came to him. Treachery isn't born out of nothingness, it lies within the mind of the average man. It seeps within our office of court and our rank and file, and there's never too much to do to cleanse Jinan of its stench. To this end, we have no choice but to gather what few men we could trust to serve our, as our eyes and ears to burrow themselves in mail posts and phone lines and nip whatever signals of treachery we could find in the bud. Better be safe. Then let the knife plunge into our hearts again. Seal, Long Yun. Uh, this is your final chance to surrender. Immediately, Long's temple throbbed with pain. Spineless dogs, he should have seen it coming. You have foolishly turned your flimsy raffle towards the rightful government of China. Re rightful, he smirked. The one true claimant to Sun Yat-sen's leg legacy. Indeed, when all you have to do is to giddily leech off of his slogans without thinking twice, do, you, do the starving peasants and limpering laborers know their meaning? Do you? Should you continue with their delusional military expeditions, your hands will be washed red with the blood of thousands. Sure, if you, even if China's bid for own freedom screams bloodshed to you. What about your dog masters? Happy little venture decades to go. What about Nanjing? What about those northeastern provinces? What about all those scars the savages have etched into our motherland? Are you not forgetting something? China is a strong growing nation. It is our nation in a common home, including yourself. Do not, in your rashness, destroy what we hold dear, and yet. Winds howl and houses creak and groan. Those impoverished and emaciated litter and congest the streets, crying out to those who have forsaken them. It is, if this is your idea of prosperity, your idea of everything we were supposed to hold dear, then I would want no part of it. China wants no part of it. Your three days of respond, anything other than total and unconditional surrender will be treated as an act of war to peace. Gao Zongwu, president of... The king of the southwest tore the paper to shreds and grabbed hold of his fountain pen. So be it. That might want an answer, or he'll get, give it to him. Jinan will fight, China will fight, until every single one of those traitors is wiped off the face of this earth. No. But, give it a rest. The morning dew collect upon the blades of grass, the darkened sky of uh, early dawn, accompanied by the earthy odor of the nearby forested hills, and become a staple of Han, Liu Zong's mornings. He witnessed farmers pack a produce on a simple wooden carts and carried them in baskets woven with straw. The chirping of the birds being the only thing he could hear aside from the cacophony of wheels grazing against gravel. He took one final breath of air before retrieving his bicycle. He had a long journey ahead of him. Traveling to Nanjing was no cakewalk. There was no ordinary delivery, however. It was not a routine order or report, but instead issued directly from the highest echelons of power in Kunming. He dared not to fathom what such a letter contained, and why it would be delivered to the doorsteps of the enemy. He could no longer stall anymore. Looking towards the color of the sky, he was probably already behind schedule. He grabbed his satchel and woolen coat, waving farewell to the passing elders who paddled east. His hair fluttering in the wind. There was no doubt the journey would be harsh, but if it was this important, he would have to endure it. Across the plains and hills. L Ligia. From the cliffs and rags and crags. Of the mountains of Yunnan. The outside world seemed remote at best. The villages that clung to the forested foothills were no more than specks of dust to the human eye, wavering in the heat waves of southern Chinese summer. Trees bloomed with lush intensity, teeming with verdant leaves that seemed to catch and reflect the sun's brilliance far away in the distance. A column of smoke flickered. A hot and humid wind heaved with heavy sighs as it cut across the foliage, grasslands, and pastures, slamming, diverting as it met the high walls of the village houses. Through his father's binoculars, Li Yuan observed the world. A son of a partisan, he and his family had first ascended the mountains as the National Revolutionary Army scattered before the Japanese advance. Having spent his boyhood here, hiding in the ravines and caverns of Yunnan's rugged western landscape, he had grown to become a deeply inquisitive young man. From his perch, he could look south and see Burma or swing east to gaze upon Laos. On a good day, the diaphanous mists that covered the fields, his field of view would come on wraps, revealing a land so strange yet so unfamiliar. Or so familiar. Rich in sights and scenes, yet none of them could compare to the view of the China to the east and north. This, as he recalled his father saying, a callous and weather beaten hand on his boy's shoulders, is our land. This is your land. Five days ago, the general had issued an order. They would finally come down to the mountains. Lee's chest pounded like war drums of the thought. They would hide no longer. They would fight. He closed his eyes and listened to the beating of his heart. And with every thump, their homeland beckons. The Liberation Army gathers. It was astonishing that Lee's comrades had managed to gather in the same place. He looked out from left to right in the meeting halls, seeing the ragged mountain soldiers turned guerrillas that was the exiled KMT Remnant Army, hailing from Burma. He saw volunteer forces belonging to the almost extinguished Chinese Communist Party hailing from the interior of Vietnam, and the neighboring Indo-Chinese nations, plus various insurgent groups sprawled all over the southeastern peripheries of China. They kept close to their own little respective groups, but the fact that they had gathered at all filled Lee's heart with a dull sense of hope. Long years speeches motivated them all into action, as actions have motivated them into speeches. They spoke loudly about the liberation of their massive home nation, from the Republican Chinese collaborator state to the West or vast industrialized cities of Manchuria and the semi independent cliques in between. I filled with a certain pride and filled in decades. 
Lee walked himself out of the meeting hall, opening up one of the side doors in the valley that surrounded it. Being only a minor officer in his guerrilla group, his presence was appreciated rather than required. He stared out across the valley. It was jam-packed with camouflaged camps, bikes, motorcycles, cars, and trucks with little streams of men flowing between it all. They would fight for China's honor for the ultimate repulsion of the Japanese men. They would not forsake the countrymen for a second longer. Hope of a generation. The remaining power of the insurgents outside Yunnan will determine how much strength they can offer us. Sealed. Long you, this is your final chance to surrender. Oh, oh yeah. Immediately, oh, 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 well. Immediately, Long, his, his temples throb with pain. Spying his dogs, he should have seen it coming. Yep, and I read this one earlier, so. Um, if you want to read this again, please go right ahead, so. Well, winds howl and creak and houses creak and all that good stuff. Very nice. And I remember I did read this one before we faded and faded up, but we did do stab in the back, so public trial. Justice across millennia, the ultimate pursuit of the Chinese people. Heavenly justice gaze upon all earth. Governing all that thrives and mediating that disrupts, and what the heavens fail to arbitrate, falls upon the mortal judge among mortal men. Such is what has been engraved into our soul, and what all descendants of the Yellow River put their utmost faith in, the judge and the scrolls of law within his hands. And who else shall be judged but the king of the south was himself? He is once more ascended, above his brothers and sisters he held so dear. Now his they look upon him again. Let those who committed sin against China under the heavens be judged under the heavens. No matter shackled or at large, and let Long Yun, ripe and supreme judge of the Southwest, deliver his final verdict. Who shall live to atone, and who shall redeem themselves only in death? Meeting your heroes. Oh, look at that. The National Revolutionary Army's 60th Corps entwined itself so much into the culture and legacy of the Yunnan that every citizen in the nation could recite at least one of their exploits as they fought their way across the vast Chinese nation. It was this group that Long Yun had dedicated so much to, and yet despite all brilliant achievements, the wider war was lost. When Lee caught wind that the corpse was being reborn, this time under the National Protection Army, he immediately signed up. Some of his men were far too old to have any business fighting another war, so the Corps set out on a recruitment campaign that eventually reached Lee's village. Despite some of the older soldiers retiring, it was rumored that Long Yun himself would be leading the unit into battle as a commander-in-chief. That excited Lee to no end. It was only now, on the eve of joining his soon-to-be comrades, did Lee feel afraid. He sat in the back of the flatbed truck with a few other recruits, tailing the end of a convoy. The engine already given out a couple times, and the rest of the convoy had seen it prudent to continue driving after the second faltering. Now, now to truly descend over the valley, the flatbed slowly crawled down. He thought his heart would give out when he first heard it. Every kid from Yunnan could recite the song but that they had heard so many times. This time, he heard it from the throats of the song was actually about the 60th Corps. At first, he could only hear the rhythm, the words of a jumble of incomprehensible jargon, but as a flatbed rounded the bend, Lee could hear both the song and the men singing it. We are from the great place of Yunnan uprising, across Kyushu and Hunan. March to the battlefield to repel invaders. Brothers dedicate their flesh, strive for the nation's emaciation, or emancipation, to protect the glory that is all left for us, to victory. Da daggers dawn. Right, daggers drawn, not draggers dawn, but daggers do wrong. Put down the mad dog. Uh, isn't it like a three-day focus or something, probably? That's probably on the left side. No? Okay. Where is it? Oh, it's down here. Return of the King. Yeah. Oh, nine days left. Cool. Locks new cross tree to deal with the issue. A sun ray of light slithered into the dark chamber, piercing through this minuscule gap in between the drawn opaque curtains. Zhang Biao widened the gap with the two of his fingers, peering out towards an area alleyway, which in overlook where nothing but shadow resided. He breathed a sigh of relief, turning towards his colleague, his hands placed firmly upon the leather satchel. There shouldn't be anyone around us. They would have surrounded the building by now. He retrieved a box of cigarettes from his pocket, setting one alight as he turned towards the window once more. What did you say to the proprietor downstairs? Don't worry, he knows nothing. Told him that I was coming here to conduct mundane business. He should have no clue. He released a heavy puff of smoke from between his lips and clenching the cigarette with his fingers as he placed his hands on the cold granite windowsill. Minutes passed by, the two men conversed sparsely, trying to come to terms with the heinous act they were going to commit. By affiliating themselves with the business of assassination, they already embarked upon the path of oblivion. They were smart and aware enough to understand this fact. Neither of them were going to back down. The time had passed for second thoughts. For deliberation, the only thing left to do was get their affairs of the heart in order and lodge a bullet in the back of Long Yun's head. Extinguished cigarette and toss it into the wooden floor, ash dispersing into the cracks between the planks. It was time. A knock echoed from the door, and the two men understood the fates. Zhang Biao loaded the pistol contained within the statue and branched for the coming battle. This is the police. We know of your plans. Surrender immediately. Never. And down with the traitors. The Nanjing Nationalist Government, the self-proclaimed legitimate ruler of all of China. We see them for uh, they really are traitors. They take heed of only the Japanese dogmaster's orders and deafen themselves to our motherland's wails from below. Their tendrils, proxies, so they say, suffocate Jinan with a grip, burrow into the G Jinan's veins and arteries, and bleed it dry all in the name of civilization. Ask sons and daughters of China, haven't they driven the knife deep enough? Shall we bear this travesty any longer? No, these bureaucrats, tax officials, and so-called middle managers of a pawn or soul. All pawns of Nanjing, all stand with the filth of the treachery. They are no less traitors than Wang Jiwei himself. And by the very association with the pretender regime, they have committed the grossest of injustice under the heavens. 
Let all those who had wronged China be judged, and the worst transgressors be condemned to death. The rest we integrate our, into our sacred struggle for liberation. Let justice be restored, and the cry forever ring in our hearts, down with the traitors, long live China. Very good. Six Emperor Tredorebus. Wang Baleng, you are hereby, hereby found guilty of high treason in that you willingly cooperated with the decadent and false government of the Japanese puppet in Nanjing. Furthermore, provided aid and succor to the Japanese imperialist armed forces and refused to aid good Chinese people that came to your aid, instead reporting them to the Japanese dudes that they had to have their way with them. For crimes that, oh, the deputy judge of the military tribunal finished reading out the verdict, and the judge read out the sentence. For crimes as severe as these, the punishment can only be death. Your offenses are frankly severe near enough, where I wish I could order you executed multiple times. Instead, I'll have to have you, to, I will have you to leave your fate after death in charge of the powers that rule the spirit world. I trust they will be able to deal with your shriveled, pitiful excuse for a soul quite well. Wayne began to stammer out some words, but the judge would have done none of it. Take him away and deal with him at once. The soldiers in the makeshift courtroom shouted the agreement and took the now convicted traitor away. As the judge filled the verdict, a gunshot was heard and a body fell to the ground. And so ended the life of Wang Baleng. His intentions and thoughts would remain a mystery forever, and would only ever be known as a traitor against the Chinese nation and his people. But the judge was unperturbed by what happened, bringing the next one. So it played out throughout the lands under the NPA control. Second expedition begins. Oh no, I've heard about this one too. The people of Yunnan gathered in groups on that thunderous day as the sound of thunderous echoes clapped, or clapped, Thunderclaps echoed behind him. Long Yun made his final speech. The National Protection Army would finally live up to their names. The organized government of China would find no glory in death. Long vow. Just beyond the four walls of the hall, the rest of the Yunnan mobilized. A soldier gave his final farewell to his wife and first child. A general went over the logistics of one of his battle plans. Factory overseers corrected a production quota for artillery shells. Yunnan had taken up arms much like the rest of the long aligned China. Now it meant, now it meant to use them. Long recalled the northern expedition to his audience. The ancient honor battle requires our sweat, blood, and tears. I take immediate immense pride in all of my sons, as does, does your homeland. We shall go forth and free every one of China's sons. We shall go forth and banish the Japanese to a cross of waters from which they came. But in his mind, he thought differently. Those wars would be against a foe far more advanced than the one he faced four years ago. They had the numbers, guns, planes, supplies, not to mention aid from one of the world's foremost superpowers. Long Yun shook his head. There was no point in pondering what ifs now. There would be no return. China would fight for its freedom or die a death a thousand cuts. The Japanese would exploit his homeland until it had no more to give, and then some. No. He shouted aloud, Our second expedition shall fight for liberation. May have it in the spirits of the brave, grant us a final victory. Rise from your shackles, brave sons of China. Well, there we go. Also, I did brew a second cup of coffee as well, so um, that is very nice. Now, I don't know if the Chinese can actually push through. Oh, oh, hello. Are we at war with Chinese League, huh? Are we actually at war with them? So I thought. Yo. Can we take Chongqing? Oh, can we not take Chongqing? Oh, don't go in then. Can I hang out first? Oh, did I press a button here? Oh, I did. Okay. It's way more sense. I want to see if I can. Ooh, if we could just take Chongqing. Get some industry going first. What is it? What, what's, oh, crap. No. For China, we vow to fight till death. How we have waited and waited in the dark, clinging onto the flickering hope in our hearts for freedom, for liberation and retribution upon those alien savages looking down from atop their mounds of flesh and bone. How we have waited and waited until now as the invader's empire creaks and groans under its own corpulence. We seize our chance at last and hope burns anew. Uh, onwards we march under the watchful gaze of the National Protection Army. The journey itself, however, will be fraught with hurdles and hardships. At this very moment, atop the palaces in Nanjing, these traitors, pretenders, and unfile sons and daughters of China, they poison her with their rotten minds and hollow cajolery. To this, we, Dr. Sun's true successors, must not stand out of the bio. We shall exert our ever-expanding influence and legitimacy upon those surrounding us. Patriots, warlords, bands, collaborators even. And with the bugles of war in hand, we shall reawaken their sense of honor and dignity. Release them from the stench of treachery and bring them into our side once more as comrades, fellow liberators. Failure to unite against the hordes of the East not only dooms our righteous cause, it dooms China's servants for a thousand years more. Onwards we march. Together as one to Nanjing, to Beijing, to every last corner of our motherland, until she is forever unshackled in subjugation, from subjugation and humiliation. I rise, all of you not want to be slaves. Oh. Man, it's independent. Take 80 out of 20 momentum to persuade them. That's independent. 100. 70 out of 30. 60. If I want these guys first. Our mission? Discreet the Hanjian government. So what do we have here? Momentum is currently 50 based on the current progress of both sides. The momentum value will be changed by zero for the, for the week. Currently, the war is skewed towards the Republic of China. Oh, crap. Which penalizes. 
Momentum is modified to the surrender progress of the nations. If NPA takes advantage, the momentum war will skew rightward. Oh, crap. Agreement for the cause. There's a lot of attack. We need a lot more. Inexperienced new recruits will temporarily affect our weekly morale gain. Oh, crap. Capture Hunan. Wuhan. Do we have Chongqing? Well, did I not give him orders? What? What? Why are we facing down here? I don't understand. I, mean, I know the goal is to just encircle and destroy, but. Change momentum tick for. Um, for 35 days. Try that one, maybe. The fate of the king's cousin. When the NPA force announced to the public that he would be brought from Kunming to his own home, Zhao Tong, for a public trial, Luhan realized what would happen and reassigned himself to his death. Surely, after all the terrible but necessary things he had done to them in the name of the Nanjing government, they would kill him painfully and then go after his family. To his surprise, that was not the case. Instead, they held him in his palatial house in Kunming. When asked the commander of the guards appointed to watch him, he said, General Long ordered us to keep you under house arrest. What a joke, Lu thought. Should have made more sense that as he heard. Long would just let the soldiers do what they wanted. Was this actual sympathy for our necessary show of familial kindness to placate the people? It mattered not in any case. What mattered was that his cousin, who had always fought back to back with him for 20 years, had stabbed him in the back. All the work Lu Han had put in developing Jinan was being poured out like the water for a suicidal crusade to liberate China, bringing all the blood and tears that Lu and Jinan had shed for nothing. Was that really all the respect Long had for all of Lu's years of reluctant rule? Sure, it would be better for him to die than face such a horrible ending. Long Yun would regret everything Lu knew. Soon he would taste the horror and barbarism of the Japanese dogs like he had in Zhuzhou and Chongqing all years ago. He finally realized that Gao's path is the only way to save China, even though it might cost his life to understand it. Now, I can only hope for the best that either Gao would be defeat the insurgency before it's too late, or stop to, to stop the Japanese devil's intent, intervention, or that his mad cousin Kitsiatic Adventure would somehow succeed despite the odds. New lands. We've finally broken into China, and the false China propped up by the Japanese has slowly leached the blood from our people. After recent victory, we've reached a part of China from their hands and into our grass, free of the imprisonment once more. It is but one victory of many, the first in a long line, yet things are not as they should be. When it came upon them, we heard the cheering, of course, the cries of liberation free to wail once again, but what we truly heard was those who did not cheer. Those Japanese appalled traitors and Han Jian sycophants who would spit at this taste of freedom and hinder our efforts in the hope that we're crawling back to their masters in Japan and dooming China once more. And those who do not care and carry no fire in their hearts, nor the will to struggle. These are only some of the drugs of sickness drug in China, a self-defeating swamp bogging us down and dragging us further from victory. This cannot carry on so long as these forces continue to be. They will only hinder the liberation movement's surge to freedom. If we're to succeed, we must show them that there is another way. We shall gather up those loyal from the integral lands we hold dear and put them to the work on the task of integrating and molding our new lands into true members of the United Front. Alongside this, we will handle local administration, implement what measures we need when we need it, and look out for those new citizens all the rest of the time. We'll show them we're not their enemy. We'll put an effort into treating them not as subjects but as a people, sparking inspiration in them to cast aside their previous notions and join our cause here, no doubt, and eventually in all of our new lands that we take. It shall only grow larger and larger until the sparks we, have, we light have erupted into a wave of a flaming spirit, uniting the Chinese spirit to fight on against the collaborators and the rising sun. The work begins now. Gains its organized movement. Oh, crap. To win the war, we must handle the conquered states properly. Start interacting with the control states, either via the selected GUI or the China G map GUI. I'm not going to touch that. It's really bad for us. Down with the traitors, of course. Tenacity. Fortify the border. We're kind of okay. Relentless attack. Mountain people would be good to do. Definitely, definitely, definitely good to do. Ooh, that'd be really good to do as well. Industry. Um, I think I'll wait for that one. Patriotism would be really good to do as well. Uh, we'll do tenacity, though. It's the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. It's going to be a long journey from Kunming to Tokyo. 3,765 kilometers, in fact. Every centimeter will be bought with our blood and a rage and, most importantly, our sheer grip. Luhan and his landlord's sick offense use our strength or ability to endure any hardship. Drive up profit margins and all by the name of an illusion. Dangled down by the marionettes on strings atop the presidential palace. What a waste. What a tragedy. Not in the domestic pursuit of work and wealth and false aspirations can be found in the fullest fulfillment of our lives. Only the trajectory of history and the path to true liberation it dictates. And today it's upon this path that we shall tread and we shall march without another look back. Well, we'll see how well we do. I'm not sure if just taking territory is a good idea. I mean, we need to get stuff too, but... 
I want to encircle them, but I don't think we'll be able to do that much because they can still prove through enemy territory. But acquiring contemplation and advancing political situations. Cao Jiang Yu did not get much sleep as he would prefer to have had gotten. Getting the letters to all the necessary couriers was difficult, and that was for the ones with an easy to find address. How the heck does a man get a letter of security to a farm with no formal address in Sichuan? Still, they were gone. It wasn't even a guard anymore, but a regular servant to Zhang, except with a low, worse salary. <clears throat> Still, there was news, too. There was something far more important than the difficult task imposed upon the respectable postal service. A massive rebellion swept the lands with fire and blood and guns, and the sun and singed edges around Yunnan spread more and more at wildfire trapping entire provinces of China in the heat of fiery war and the light towards the common victory. News? Zhang read Cao's face more than he read his letters at this point. It was infuriating that Cao was reminded for the 60th time that how much day he was wished he was paid more. Rebellion. Yunnan's been taken by rebels and spreading, and the Empire's not very pleased by the changes in circumstances. Oh, and do you have any idea of the composition of the rebellion? Zhang talks as if he knew nothing about it, a very obvious lie, but one he couldn't be called out on, on which it was the best kind of lie. Calamitous, nationalists, bandits, peasants, anyone really. Any, everyone's following Long Yun's call. Zhang smirks. So are governors being beamed back by bandits? I don't think our soldiers are much stronger than the merchants they've played upon. So what do you th make of it? Zhang smiled and lied? I'm not sure. Uh, that's what I do every day. Uh, I'm not sure. I have no opinion about all political matters and wars and stuff. Oh, God, no. Of course not. Why would I have an opinion? Is it really my place to have an opinion like that? No, I don't know. I want y'all to go here, if you can. Chong Ching, don't lose that thing. Oh, prison construction. Not a bad time to do it. Oh, actually, no. Hospital construction, we don't believe in that. We believe in this one. Wow, we are losing very quickly here. Oh, yeah. Um, obviously, I should be attacking with mostly the good units, but I want to see if we can just take as much territory as possible first. Alright, so I do know we're going to need a couple spare divisions in reserve eventually, but... Possibly we'll get more political power, more attack and defense, that's good. Tenacity. Actually, what's the legitimacy like? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's really good. Boomer Road Revived. That's still bad to have. Road of Prosperity. Uh, New Zealand's office. Is good. Oh, that's not bad, yeah. I like that a lot, actually. Legitimacy. Three production units. That's not bad. Fortify the border. Mountain people. 3,000 years of China's dynasties could barely keep the Southwest under control. We are a mountain people. Use of hardship. From the cruelty of nature and our fellow men alike, we are tough, cunning, and determined. This natural predisposition will be honed to a fine edge and driven into the neck of the Hanjian. Mountain troops, trained at high altitudes and hardened by the brutality of their everyday lives. Our greenest recruits have greater stamina, better survival skills, and more in inured to difficulties than the battle-hardened veterans of weaker nations. We endure now, we shall destroy. Resilience shall be a shield with which we shall pair the spear of ferocity. We are a mountain, unmovable, and we are an avalanche, unstoppable. Yeah, now they're definitely pulling out more soldiers here. We've lost 2,000. Oh, we've lost quite a few more, haven't we? Oh, crap, come on. Come out if you can. Ooh, now they're attacking us too. That's not good. We may have to stop the attacks very soon. Just in general. Yeah. It's fine. You can probably still attack here, though. Oh, yeah, they're definitely attacking now. Ooh, can you actually take that tile? Taking that tile would be pretty good, actually. I'm going to wrap those territories up as well. Yeah, don't worry about attacking right now. Wait, why are you attacking there? Hey, don't attack there, ding dongs. Oh, I totally told you to attack. My bad. I mean, I don't mind if you can win, but if you can't, then I don't want you to attack, really. It's fine right there. I, I literally told you to stop attacking. Why do you keep attacking? Why are you wasting lives? I, I paused it. How many times do I need to pause it? What the heck? I guess we got that tile. That's nice. Peace conference is over. Oh, now they're really attacking there, huh? That's fine. Nice. Good. Get that wrapped up. That'd be great. Nasty is good. Mountain people next. 
Ooh, don't lose too much yet. I think the goal is now just kind of defend on the line and then pull out some of the good soldiers and then push from there. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just hold. There we go. We can do that, but we probably want to wait. Hit and run tactics first? Yeah. They say abandons are the bane of Zenon's existence. They rob, they bribe, and they strain Luhan security personnel often to the breaking point. Indeed, chaos and degradation often falls in their wake. But as long as you can realize more and more from his encounters with those unlawful men, perhaps there exists a peculiar kind of valor in the dealings? After all, bandits never fight a battle they can't win. They strike and flee from the from in two places unseen. They always have a backup plan. Let us copy the band at the tactical level, or units shall move quickly, striking from positions of strength and returning before the enemy can get their boots on. Bandit chiefs have been conscripted and straight from the prisons to become petty officers. Teach the conventionally minded army how to fight unconventionally. It may be dishonorable in the eyes of some, but if we but if we win, it'll all be worth it. And oh, which one do we want to use? Chun Tuang. Uh, no. Basic inf. I use the basic inf. Actually, you know what? If anything, we'll probably duplicate it. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. What are they attacking with? Like, really specialized forces. Holy crap. Stop attacking there, dude. Into, make them run into our lines. I mean, we haven't lost that many guys or anything like that, but still. Alright, so you guys probably like the big boys. Well, bigger boys. Best infantry. Thank you. Guys, um, we got a little bit of time. We can probably get a little bit more uh, army XP racing, too. I got 27 combo with logistics. Go with that. You are these specialists. We'll send half you guys out into a different field composition. Under this guy. Are they here? No? Okay. Just six. It's fine. Anything there? Nope. That's fine. Best inf. Gonna go bing, bong, boom. Maybe. Hey, if you want to be a better industrial expertise, please go right ahead. Yeah, you guys are taking forever to get to the front line. Holy crap. Well, I'll definitely make up that army XP. Yeah, the game's just a little laggy, that's all. Not bad. Get less attack because of that. Those guys get on the line first. Give us a little bit of time. I don't know if there's really any time that we need. Oh. Oh, it's actually going down now. That sucks. Mount people will be very good. Ooh, oh, that's pretty good too. Very nice. Head run tactics, yes, please. Fortify the border. Because we didn't want to get down here too. While the coal and iron we explored in such horrific quantities now being put to better use, some of our mines are unnecessary now that we don't sell our lifeblood for petty gold from foreign devils. That has left some two to three thousand, thousand, hundred thousand men and women with experience in mining and quarrying with nothing to do. Fortunately, Long Union provides. With such a large, not to mention skilled workforce, we begin an ambitious project of fortification along the border. Bunkers, trenches, underground networks to connect the remote mountain holds. Beneath the mountains and the mists where once we dug greedily can now dig with purpose. In the words of bunker coordinator Miao Mai, we're a drill bit. The enemy's a Stray finger. When the middle hits the meat, we'll be ready. Why are they not attacking? Why are they... What's wrong with y'all? Secrets revealed. The reports lay across Long Yoon's desk, a hard scrabble array of information that have been slowly leaking in for a while now. Ever since his war of national liberation began, the opposing reorganized government has been failing. The army weak just as the king of Southwest had predicted. Optimism has been flying high for a quick advance, and the these reports come crawling in as if to smother such hopes. It began as murmurs. <clears throat> Then involved in the scatter reports, so now has matured to the hard won communication, hard communication from his generals. The reorganized government has been begun fielding certain elite soldiers, ones that far outshine any other in the battlefield, friend or foe, well disciplined, well armed, and with an unyielding fighting spirit, determined to be to, to the last to destroy the foe. They were not men from the IJA nor a top of the line foreign mercenaries, they were assuredly Chinese. They may well be the will to be a true opponent of the liberation front, and the generals all reported that as each day goes by, they only grow in number. A secret army, and yet the war had been going so well before. A string of victories against a collaborating scum, doubt stirred within Long Yun as he rubbed his temples. Had he been deceived? If so, it was by Gao. Gao Zong Wu was a severed head of the dragon that Japan impaled on a stick and hailed as China, a coward who had willingly sold his nation to the emperor in Tokyo. He wouldn't rule out a cheap trick, but for what reason? Highly trained secret army practically burrowing from the ground in Nanjing? He had, he had, had he been planning to fight? If not against him, then oh, against his overlord? 
Long Yun shot to his feet. The sheer adrenaline of such an idea seeming to force him to action. No, he said out loud, only to himself. Gao Zongwu was a traitor to his country, and far too spineless to consider going against his master. It sent these elites to fight the liberation front after all. He had no sympathy for, for his own countrymen fighting for freedom, and that alone would seal his fate. Let his elite force come. They were only the next in line. If we cannot destroy them, we will never destroy that which the Japanese will throw at us, and then it will be China that is destroyed instead. Our triumph or demise, whichever comes first. I'm very surprised they don't want to actually attack. Because these guys are decked out with all sorts of equipment. Like, it's ridiculous. Let's get a guy in here first. These are the best of the best that we have. My god, I hope we don't have any supply issues. Let's go in immediately. Nice. Can't run tactics? Good. Board by the border. Not one step back. It's the universally acknowledged truth of the war that most casualties are reflected in the pursuit of the fleeing foe. To ensure we minimize losses, save loyalists' lives, and better spend our resources. Long units declared that we shall never run away again. In fortifications and in the line of battle, we are creating a special agency. A veteran from the old Tungun 36th Division, Pai Hushan, is settled in the southwest. He recounts how the 36th was used as a blocking unit in the Battle of Nanjing in 1937. Employing this tactic with dedicated blocking units behind the front line, ready to fire anyone who retreats without orders, we'll ensure our men stay in the fight and bring the enemy to their knees. It was also ensure that if the front line is eliminated, there will be an entrenched and fanatical second line to meet the exhausted attackers. Nice. Oh, look at that. Nice. Defensive organization. Offensive would be nice, but we don't have tanks. Unless the flag would be nice, but there you go. Even more organization, plus 15 and more defense? Nice. Awesome, 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 awesome. Makes us way stronger, hopefully. Nice. Alright, so you guys keep where you're at. Let them deploy wherever they want. Actually, send half you guys here immediately, anyways. Ah, send them all here. Because then we'll attack here too and circle and destroy. If possible. Oh, they want to attack. Okay. We're okay with that. Oh, hold. You go in there, anyways. Because you're going to immediately turn and face that direction. And we'll get some extra support, too. And. Boom. You go in. Circle and destroy. Peace has been brought to Vietnam. Well, that's nice. What is this? L? Current legitimacy is 3.46. Conquest and Warlord bonuses modified every week. Warlord Total War Momentum. Our caps of 40, which can be increased further through recognized and acknowledged by potential allies. This is morale, which is zero, which sucks. Right now, momentum is not bad. Invitation to the United Front. Change in war momentum. Change by 1.75. Okay. Well. It'll take 60 momentum. Well, what's our momentum now? Well, I guess it is 63. Yeah, probably won't bite them. That's probably the thing we want to do. Oh, you old. Nice. Very good. If anything, I want to... S I don't remember. It, you might have to hold down here. I could be very wrong. So just in case, at least I have one division down here. Lee Mi. Hope you do really well, man. Do the best you can. Hey, look. It's only one division, but you know what? It's better than nothing. And that's a lot. That's a lot in there. Destroy traitors at all costs. Good job, guys. So you guys are now going to be right here, and we're going to go... Whee! One, two, bing, bong, boom. Circle these guys over here, too. There we go. You just plus? Oh, what is this? Wipe out the Hunjian's connections. More momentum. That'd be good. Alright, uh, give us a little more, couple more days first. We need more organization. Fortified by the board is pretty good. Uh, not one step back. Uh, heard of that DLC before. Never again. The China of today is cowed and broken. The China of yesterday was weak and decadent. And the China of tomorrow will be remembered based on our actions in the here and now. We're ready to fight and we're eager to fight. 
We're resilient and furious and brutal. So too, China must be. The National Protection Army's mission has been crystal clear from the beginning. To forever dispel the tenebrous mists of the century of humiliation, and to forever save our beloved homeland from the savage talons of imperialism, Japanese or otherwise. We all know that China will never be invaded again, that China will never be beaten again, that China will never be insulted again, while we draw breath never again. Oh, they want to attack us, not with me. See if we can do anything there. I'll support the attack you guys go into. Support it. Nice. Which ones are a staff officer panel? Relentless assault. Force attack. It's not bad. Nice. Oh. They're attacking with quite a few fuddy duddies, huh? Big papas, huh? Song, Zilian. Hold first, hold first. Don't worry about attacking. You actually might be able to break over. Maybe. And if not, that's okay. Are they attacking us in just one place? Yeah, they are. Oh, never mind. Second place, too. Not one step back, and never again. Combat schooling, huh? Oh, we were on what earlier? Probably basic training or minimal training? Patriotism? Mm. Hmm. Well, maybe it's industry. The task of national liberation begins with the factories of the nation. In the hearth of the industrial furnaces, the future of the nation is hammered into shape. The weapons of the manufacturers arm the soldiers, and the uniforms woven by the textile mills clothe their bodies as much as they march into war. China cannot rely upon foreigners to win their liberty. Only by the tears and sweat of her sons and daughters can she be free. Only by winning the struggle on the home front can she break her bonds of slavery. You know, it has for many centuries been the backwater of the Chinese nation. Yes, people are dedicated for their faith. Faith in a free China. Faith that their pre offense will be granted for the honor of carrying the struggle for independence. Decrees for labor, conscription shall be issued, but they not, need not be. Already the people have begun to chant the cry, we shall be free like our grandfathers were too. You can still probably win here. Good God, this is brutal. Go, 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 go. That's all I want is that one tile. And we've got it. Nice. And of course, we still have to do that up there, too, but that's fine. You know what? I want to attack there. They're going to move down south for there anyways. If we attack there, you still might be able to do well, maybe. Yeah, I'll do very well there. Oh, that was good, that, yeah. Will they join us? Oh, momentum's not bad. Two divisions, help them out here. A little bit of time, good. Technically, I don't think they're cut off, but, you know, still. Camera over unites them, that's fine, whatever. Yeah, they can still move through. Oh, that's Shang-Chi, though. Abdicate. Patriotism, of course, industry. Military policy. Oh, crap. Spot's gonna be very bad through here, but, you know, we'll deal with it as best we can. Go into there first and see if we can wipe them out. And yeah, which we can. That's great. Shoot a hold. G Khan joins the National Liberation Front to the most esteemed General Long. My utmost apologies for the delayed response, owing to troubles both within and across our borders. Fret no more, however, for right here and now I give my word the entire Xi Kang shall flock to your aid. Of course. Woe is me for having to wrestle mounds of my own men just to deliver this message. Skeptics, both young and old, litter our ranks, grumbling of insurmountable odds and advocating for sanctuary under the greater government. Audacious enough to decry supposed suicide and throw threats of desertion in my face, yet too faint-hearted to embrace the truth. How will there be any sanctuary or safe haven under the rising sun when its rays remain slick with our blood? The retort I gave them was simple. Had the entire war against Japanese aggression been suicide by that logic? Had the demises and sacrifices of millions of our warriors and patriots just so the rest of us and Zee Kang could live on as free men? Been suicide? No. Never was before, never will be now. To commit suicide is to die for selfishness, to perish on the battlefield in our... One last shot at freedom, however, is to die for a cause far more sublime, so that our descendants may live and be welcomed to this world by a bright, free China. Arduous a task it may be, the rogue officers were eventually made to see reason once more that that I am more than grateful for. No more overtalk necessary. The Japanese puppets have denied their mighty sword. Today, Xi Kang and his people stand at your command. Your future, Liu Wenhui, fellow liberator. Welcome another good noble patriot. Nice. 70, 80, 100, wow. So you're next. Nice. War momentum is quite a bit more on our side. 
So far, not bad. And that helps us with legitimacy, right? Oh, look at that. More output, construction speed, political power gain, stability, free production units. Nice. Hey. Now we're going to deal with these guys, and maybe we can push these guys out. I don't know. We'll see what happens. We don't want to be too successful too soon. And actually, are you on... Oh! Are you actually in the war too? They are in the war. Look at that. That's pretty awesome. Immediately move on in now. We could save supplies by just taking our time with this, but we're not going to take our time with this. They're probably not going to be starving here too, but whatever. Never again. Industry. Yeah, they can, they can freely move through here, which sucks. Crap, that's not good. We should Eh, whatever. By long's command, every woman a worker. Up to that much amount. Uh, every woman a worker. Women will hold up half the sky. During the previous war, while the armies of men marched throughout China to stem the tide of the Japanese advance, women stayed home and managed matters of the household. Over time, as young men were conscripted and massed in the National Liber Revolutionary Army, women filled a significant role in staunching the labor shortage that followed such a drastic measure. They became pillars of the community, maintaining the structure of the Chinese society through their will alone. The men returned defeated, but their spirit of resistance was now universal, transcending the boundaries of gender. War has come again, and perhaps the greatest that will come in the coming century. Will the men once again forge their plowshares into swords, rifles, and other implements of warfare? We will ask women to stand with us again. They shall work in the factories, they shall toil in the fields, and they shall fight for the freedom as much as China fights for hers. And then, the men who fought the battle before us understood the fundamental character of the imperialist. Crook fiends concerning solely with their own gain, profit, and influence. They may approach us with honey words of compromise, conditions, treaties, and truces. We know the truth. We have borne witness to it for twenty miserable years. There can be no negotiating with a tiger when your head is in its mouth. And even less when you're attempting to take it out. This war is fought for only one reason, only. Regardless of how it's a fate, phrased. To drive out the invader, to destroy the machines that he used to exploit us. To bring justice to the long-suffering peoples of China. To win back China for the Chinese nation. To Zen and this end only, we march, united as one in our unbreakable resolve. There's no degree of disunity tolerable with the enemy, while the enemy still tramples the soul of our nation. And we certainly will not tolerate any defeatists. There's only five divisions here, but still not bad. Hmm... Uh, that's more. That's more cost. I'm gonna say no for now. We're gonna have to have some big encirclements later. Crush and kill. Completely bombarding them on all sides. Traitors to the cause. You know what we could do? Hmm. I'll wait. One, one, two, three, four. That's all right. Well, let's push him out of here for now. That's kind of doing. Not bad. Oh, look at that morale. Eighteen point eight five. Not bad. Twenty point five two. Nice. Let's go on first. All right. So let's help take these guys out immediately. It's fine. All right. Take them out. I know we need to make more sequence. And we'll make a lot more around here too. We're gonna like probably go around here and take them out like this there. So Beast Conference. Is it Muscovine again? Might be. Yeah. I was, I was pretty much right on it. Cool. Nice job, guys. Now we gotta figure out how we're gonna encircle and destroy now. Um, one, two, three, encircle. I wanna go up here and encircle four divisions instead. We could try that. Of course, we might wanna consider supply loss and stuff like that. Not bad. We just need more political power. Oh well. Yeah, Biaka is very strong.
up to 39 divisions, up to 40. We actually have quite a few, which is really nice. And no more waste. During Luhan's time, the bourgeoisie and the landlords of Yunnan ruled the province like feudal landlords. These people came to possess a capital political prisoners or powers as a governor sought to centralize power into the one convenient class of people that he can cooperate easily with, not under long. There was no sympathy to the philosophies of Marxism and Communism. No excess wealth should remain under the warlord of the Southwest. In a war of national liberation, there could be no such thing as luxury. The nation is a person's highest calling. And to indulge in material possession would constitute a betrayal of that duty. The government shall seize the assets of the local bourgeoisie, and the lands of these landlords will be subjected to the same treatment. These factories will, and workshops will go towards the war effort, and the lands would go to the peasants and farmers. The war is in everyone's mind, and for the freedom to be realized, all must sacrifice. I'm suffering any sort of attrition here? No? Good. That's your goal right there. How much equipment do we have? We're not doing bad, actually. You guys at 18 combo with, which is standard. I we just need more divisions probably in the end. Come attack us, boys. Cause then after that, I want you to go there. Oh, you are attacking us, nice. Maybe we want a worker. By Long's command, it doesn't take a degree in economics to understand that a total war economy is totally unsustainable. Every now, even now, Yunnan's workers talk to each other in hushed voices, striking revolution while the peasants withhold their harvest from our units and leave our city starving. Fortunately, though, he's enlightened in our government has cooked up a remedy. Arrest in prison time must become the norm for striking industrial workers, whilst extreme violence will unfortunately have to be used against these workers they, that deny us the lifeblood of the nation. For victory, no sacrifice is too great. Absolutely. Cut these guys off if you can. Do that to there, to there, and then push up through here. Like you, we can also shove divisions in here too. If I have to, I'll force it. Force it. I knew I threw another division in there quickly enough, but that's fine. Doesn't matter. Look at that. Um, air superiority. Yeah, I'll go air supremacy, why not? We have planes? I have a few planes here and there. Not much. Really not much at all. But I'd rather have them than not. Then not at all. There you go. Nice. Oh, I see how they're doing it. And then, ooh, it hurts their soft stack and stuff like that, but everything for the war machine, further mobilize it, patriotism. Kai Yi's tale is known far and wide throughout the provinces of China, and Yunnan, his home province, he was even more popular. Long Yun considers himself as one of his many admirers. Kai Yi's fight to prevent the restoration of monarchy and to reunite China against the warlordism that was prevalent at the time was halted by the sudden death in 1916. Yet that would light up the torch of his struggle and take it to the future. Dr. Sun, Chiang of the old KMT, even the communist dream, the same dream of Kai Yi, Long Yun, is no different. As such, there can be no dissent tolerated during the War of Liberation. Only by destroying the chains of servitude can China be free. Anything else must be of secondary importance. Let him move around first. Make it look like we're weak. You're all here ready to go, huh? But are you really ready to go? That's a real question. God dang it, does it lag hard, this mod? Oh, goodness. We have two divisions there. Let them, let them attack us. Let them attack us. It's fine. I didn't even focus on that stuff anyways, whatever. Let that division move through first. Let those divisions move. Alright. You can actually win here. Maybe. Maybe a little bit of a maybe. And immediately move up north. Nice. Come on, get in there, go, go, go. Oh, by long command. Enemy agent turn, okay. Nice. How about right here? How about right there? 
Okay. Okay. See what, what good games they're playing. Playing games on the phone, huh? Oh, wow, look at that. Nice. Four Sports is doing pretty darn well. Burn the symbols of the Yamamoto. Or Yamato. Words of Hirohito and Piro Mon hung on the government buildings. Japanese flags in every town and city doesn't it make you sick. Even if it does not, it makes the country sick. The Emperor of Japan is an obscene joke. A tyrant monster in the rough shape of a human, putrid and foul he is, more so for his uh, pantomime insistence that he has some spark of divinity. He is not a god, nor does he hold the mandate of heaven. He is barely a man. He is an animal of oppression and Japanese perversion. Burn his image wherever you find it. In his place, raise the sacred blue sky with the right sun. And blaze in the proud center of the true republic. Restore the visage of Dr. Sun Yat Sen to the altar, so that his gaze may watch over us all once more. Burn and cleanse. Burn and cleanse, my friends. Song is doing a great job so far. Come on, capture them. I want to get at least two divisions in circle there. Good, and I'll go in immediately. It's not much, but it's still two divisions, so. Guangxi joins the National Liberation Front. To the esteemed General Lam, be notified that the Guangxi Pacification Army shall stand with you in your struggle. The Nanjing government has regrettably proven itself to be little more than a marionette on strings, still reserving to be the scar on the dustbin of history. Do not, however, mistake this letter for unconditional amnesty towards the countless transgressions your forces committed with in our borders more than three years ago. I also find it crucial on this special occasion to remind you on one major other matter. Be wary of communist elements lurking within your ranks. Under no circumstances must you forget that those bandits stabbed China in the back and threw her to the Japanese dogs, a fellow remnant of the old order. I expect you to remember this truth as well as I. Regardless, consider me most honored and elated to join your crusade for liberation. Let justice be forever restored to our homeland. Under the combined strength, the vigor, and tenacity of three provinces, let all internal squabbles be cast aside for the moment, for the fate of our nation stands above all. Of this, I put my faith in you. To freedom. Jia Wei, commander of the 4th Military Region. Welcome. United we stand. We got him, my friends. Well, we already have 80. 89. Holy crap. Hope lies with us. There can be no mistake that son Li Ren is fortunate to have been allowed to keep his old uniform from the days of the National Revolutionary's Army, for once excusing himself from the performance of his usual exercise routine. Sun had first bathed and then donned the old uniform for the first time in too many years, though it was no longer was as fitting as it once was. Sun exposed, or supposed, the most strenuous of exercise could not halt the inexorable march of time after gathering those belongings he could carry easily. Sun mounted his horse and began a long ride to the west, in the direction of Yunnan. You don't know always a proud province, and now the center of a great insurrection that aimed to throw out the Japanese and reclaim China, under the leadership of the always clever warlord Long Yun, how old a son might be getting along. Long Yun is even older, a generation separating the two of them. For a moment, Sun wondered if this might inhibit the man's leadership, but he turns away such thoughts. He's becoming an old man himself, yet neither of them can afford to let that be a benefit to Japan, even the slightest. There's simply too much at stake, and far, far too many people to let down. Boost some rock cap, nice. Oh, wow. Oh, I forgot about this. That's cost the defense. Whoa. War measures? A favorite opponent, one of the superpowers of the world, the NPA is weak. Stand a chance against the rising sun, we need to utilize China's potential to its fullest. As our army enforces military control throughout the country, militarization levels stay able to determine the amount of resources dedicated to the warfare. High militarization will improve military status, ready at the cost of legitimacy. Militarization in the level also determines the effectiveness of the war's states, uh, states' war measures. The higher the militarization level, the less costly and more effective our actions will be. I don't know. Oh, is that cost? Oh, crap. Is that cost of power? Is that worth even doing? Oh, well. Oh, well. Also neutral. Whoa. Shang-Chi is not completely opposed to us, which is good. Huh. Okay, well, we'll see. I'm not really sure how to do that, but that's, that's pretty fucking complicated. Cheng Sha would be good to get to. Oh, wow, look at all that lag once again. 
Lots and lots and lots of lovely little laggies. Okay, this is lagging extremely hard. What's going on? Muscovine is probably being released. That's a good old puppet. We can circle four divisions. That'd be great. Yeah. Released. And there they go. Alright. Well, not bad. Got 142,000? Like nothing for China. Labor to the mine heart. Luo Rui, Rui, Rui was confused. He was a propagandist affiliated with the MPA. Once working with the CCP, Master Yi himself had sent him on a secondment, a secondment to help with the MPA's propaganda efforts. Of course, that didn't mean anything right now. Not compared to the dilemma that faced him as he noisily slurped down some passable noodle soup in a radio station downtown Kunming. What dilemma was this? Simple. Luo Rui, Rui just didn't know on earth to broadcast on the next prop propaganda broadcast. Repeats of old patriotic songs or, or of Yu Fei's River of Blossoms could only go so far, and General Long had been very explicit that he did not want the propaganda effort to be predicated upon every word that issued forth from, from his mouth. Rui quite admired that about the general. Looking through a stack of literature that had been sent from over the, from the university, Rui happened upon the works of Ku Yuan, a poet of the late Warring States period. Reading this ancient poet's work more closely, Rui realized that there was an undercurrent of what one might even call patriotism in the old words. Perhaps there was something there, Rui thought as he flipped more vigorously through the book. Perhaps yes. From the next week, recitations of Ku Yan, now increasingly referred to as the first patriotic poet of Chinese history, due to every radio broadcast from the transmitter in Kunming. This was the beginning of a trend that influenced propaganda throughout the NPA territories and, eventually, the culture of China after the war ended. <clears throat> no well, O people of China, that the way of the collaboration as traitors is one in which loyalty brings disaster. <clears throat> And destroy the last remnants. The Japanese were not content merely dominating us by force, they justified their actions endlessly in print and radio, thinking that they could drown out the feelings of China in an endless sea of noise. Those same stations that once crooned whatever tunes Tokyo found fashionable now spew foul vitriol, labeling the patriotic impulse of the common man as dangerous and misguided, the same papers that lauded the great theft of Jinan's labor as advancing the interests of a foreign sphere now cry foul, and write at length of what great losses the overthrowing of our shackles mean. No more will we tolerate the insidious whispers of the enemy to poison our righteous effort. No more will we give them the chance to justify and explain the unjustifiable and unexplainable, except for what we need and what we approve. These mouths of the enemy will know nothing more than tinder for the fires that keep the movement warm and, over time, burn out the rest of the parasites hanging on. But unfortunately, that is going to be the end of today's episode in which hopefully in the next one we'll kick out of Japan fully. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we will no longer have a dysfunctional high command, but have a widespread cronyism within our command. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.